I'm a teacher. And we're going to do a little math tonight. It's a, it's, a, it's a basic math equation. Powdered donuts plus showers equals choice-filled lives. So how does that math equation work? Well, well first you have to understand what I mean uh, when I say I'm a teacher. So I, I met my wife speed dating. And uh, so for those of you who are single, I, it's the best six minutes you can, you know, you can spend. So here, here, I met my wife speeding. Now the woman before, the, you know, 12 women, 12 men. So the woman before my wife, uh, she asked me, the first thing she asked me is she's like, well, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a teacher. And she says, that's it. And I say, yes. And she pulls out her Blackberry. So this is when people still thought Blackberry was cool. And for the next five minutes and 30 seconds, she typed away on her Blackberry. And it was in that moment that I realized that teaching is absolutely the greatest calling on the planet. And I love teaching. And one of the reasons I love teaching starts with the story of the powdered donut and a young girl named Emily. And so here's the deal. I was a fifth grade math teacher. And we ran classes Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5. And then we had Saturday classes. And on Saturday classes, the kids got to choose from all types of activities, art, dance, music, sports, photography. You name it, they got to choose it. And then the kids who struggled in math, they got to come to me for remediation. So you can picture it. Now pretend, go back in your minds to when you were nine years old and all your friends are going to have fun and you got to come to me for math. And so I was always looking for ways to make math class as fun as possible, and I loved it. We came up with all types of games. And one of the games we came up with was called Racing for Donuts. And here's how Racing for Donuts worked. The kids who got the math problems done first and got them all correct got to choose a donut. Everyone understand the game? OK. <laughs> So are anyone familiar with the Hostess three color, you know, the box with the three types of donuts in them? Yeah, they still sell them, but now that we're a little health, you know, this was in the early, the mid-90s. We weren't quite as health conscious. I feel really bad. I was serving powdered donuts and then McDonald's for lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, America's youth, well-educated. So, <laughs> but we were doing these races for donuts. And the, the, the three types of donuts, anyone remember what they were? OK. There was plain, sometimes cinnamon. The plain actually has a name. It's called Old Fashioned. Anyone remember the other two types? Chocolate, powdered. So now put yourself in the mind of a nine-year-old. And if you, now there were like 10 to 12 kids, and there were nine donuts. Remember, these are the kids who needed some extra help in math. And, and so the first kid who finished them and got them all right, what type of donut would they have chosen? Exactly. So you guys can put yourself in that mind of a nine-year-old, right? No matter what, they chose chocolate. So kids one, two, and three, they chose the chocolate donuts. Four, five, and six, what did they choose? Powdered. Powdered. Exactly. Seven, eight, and nine, what did they do? No, no. They left it alone because <laughs> literally there are no nine-year-olds who will eat an old-fashioned donut <laughs> Regardless, like they gotta be like it's ridiculous hunger. It's a level of hunger that just is really hard to find to get a nine-year-old to eat an old-fashioned donut. So they would leave the old-fashioned donuts for their teachers. And so there was this young girl named Emily, and she would come every Saturday. And so now I want you to remember back to when you were in middle school, uh, maybe even high school, maybe even here at Franklin and Marshall. And there are students in class who think they have the answer right every time. OK, you're starting to get what I'm talking about. But they don't. <laughs> they always think they're right, but they aren't. And so it's really funny. She was an amazing kid. And she would raise her hand, convinced that she was right, and she wasn't. Hardly ever right. <laughs> And she would raise her hand, and as a teacher, you're thinking in your head, oh my god, I have to find another way to say not quite, or no, or you tried so hard, but that's not it. Can we get some help from a friend? I'm going to come back to you. Really, I'm so happy you participated, but it's still not right. And so after a while, you sort of say, please, get the hint. And the beautiful thing about it is day in and day out, Monday through Friday, her hand would come up. And Monday through Friday, there would be many tears along the way, and she would show up every single Saturday. 
every single Saturday. Because it was a quasi-choice. Because I was like, oh, do y'all want to come to Saturday tutoring? And they'd be like, eh, I'm like, you sure you want to come? I'm like, you really sure you want to come? So it was a quasi-choice for the kids. She came every Saturday. Saturday after Saturday after Saturday after Saturday, she never got a chocolate donut. She never got a powdered donut. She never even had the chance to turn down the old-fashioned donut. <laughs> but then something happened in March. It's not a movie here, right? There's no soundtrack. It's not like Gangster Paradise is going to come on and the seas are going to part. No, no, no. Emily didn't get a chocolate donut. She didn't come in fourth or fifth. But she did earn the last powdered donut. And like a nine-year-old, she ate that powdered donut with such pride. And it was all over her face. And it was in her hair. And I was like, wow. And it was that moment in 1997 that I realized that alongside the academic skills, there are a set of character skills that are equally important to the type of life outcomes that we all aspire to, the type of choices in life that we all aspire to. And in that moment, I knew, I knew that Emily had something that would take her far. And Emily, at the time, now, there are 141 KIPP schools today around the country, and we serve kids through, from kindergarten through 12th grade, and we support them to and through colleges, including here at Franklin and Marshall, which is an amazing place. But at the time, we only had middle school, and Emily went off to high school. And I'd like to tell you that she went to like a top, top school, but guess what? She didn't go to a top, top school. She went to a very good school, and then came around senior year, and guess what? It isn't a movie. I'd like to say she graduated, and she was the valedictorian, and she gave a speech about how meaningful the powdered donut experience was in her life. <laughs> but that didn't happen. She graduated, not at the top of the class, but near the top of the class. And then I'd like to say that she went off to one of the top schools in the country, the ones you hear about every day in the paper, and yet that also didn't happen. She didn't go to a top 10 school or a top 25 school, or a top 50 school. She did go to a school in the top 75, and then comes around senior year in time for graduation, at which I was honored to be invited. And guess what? Emily was not the valedictorian speaker. But Emily did graduate from college. And she was the first in her family to graduate from college. And she graduated near the top of her class in college. And Emily proved to her family that girls could graduate from college. Because in fifth grade, she was told that girls don't go to college. But Emily believed in the powder, the power of the... <laughs> <laughs> Emily believed in the powder, power of the powdered donut. And so a funny thing happened after she got her BA. She went in and got a master's degree in social work. And she became a social worker. And she started running her own Saturday tutoring classes. But she was given grapes and apples and bananas. <laughs> but the story of the powdered donut is so much more than the story of Emily. It's the story of 4,200 other KIPP kids in college today. It's the story of the 10,000 KIPP kids who are going to be in college in uh, two years. It's the story of KIPP, how we grew from serving 47 kids in the city of Houston to over 50,000 kids in 20 states in the District of Columbia. It's the story of how we teach. It's the story of weaving character skills and academic skills seamlessly into the DNA of our classes, into the DNA of our schools. So when people think of the powdered donut story, they think of famous stories. They think of these movie stories. They think of J.K. Rowling being rejected 13 times before someone picked up Harry Potter and she became, well, she became J.K. Rowling. <laughs> they, 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 they think of stories like Ray Charles who, who, who lost his sight and then lost his parents and then became, well, he became Ray Charles. And yes, they too show the story of the powdered donut. They too show the story of what it means to struggle and become not an underdog, but a wonder dog. And the story of the powdered donut is the story of each of you and me. It's the story of me when I was nine years old walking into the principal, uh, principal's office as an 
fully able student who rode the long bus with all of the other kids who were my friends. And I walked out of the principal's office that, that day as a learning disabled student who now rode the short bus. It's the story of everyone here who overcame and continues to overcome struggles so that we can have choice-filled lives. So the powdered donut, in mathematical terms, translates into choice-filled lives. But there's a little bit of powder that we have to sprinkle on the powdered donut. And so what's the powder? It has to do with showers. So the equation, who can remind us of the equation here? Powdered donuts plus showers equals choice-filled lives. So what about a powdered donut and a shower transforms an underdog into a wonder dog? My hope is that sometime in the next 24 hours, almost everyone here will take a shower. It's a, it, it's a safe bet. Maybe 48 hours. It's college. I get it. <laughs> Finals. Stuff happens. I understand. But eventually you're going to get around to taking a shower. <laughs> and the world breaks down in showers into two different groups. There are nighttime showers and there are morning showers. This is the first way it breaks down. So how many of you are nighttime showers? All right. And how many of you are morning showers? All right, cool. We're going to leave that alone. We're not going to mess with that. That's, that just messes you up too much. But here's what we are going to do, and here's the homework assignment. When you shower, the world breaks down into two groups. Those who wash above the neck first, and those who I like to call body washers. You start below the neck. So how many of you are body washers? You start washing your bodies. All right, so it's always about half. And how many, that would mean the other half, are about head washers. So the next time you take a shower, sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours, I would like you to switch. <laughs> That's it. Those of you who start below the neck, start above the neck. Those of you who start above the neck, start below the neck. And guess what is going to happen? And since I'm not going to see you again, we'll have to talk about it now. What's going to happen when you switch? You'll feel uncomfortable. What else is going to happen? Your brain will grow. OK, your brain will grow, because <laughs> you'll have to think about taking a shower. What else is going to happen? I'll drop the soap. <laughs> Highly possible. And you might drop the soap because you get confused. You'll start wondering, did I wash this part? Did I not wash this part? Huh? It's really not that relaxing. <laughs> And then you will do something. You will go back to the way you always take a shower. And you might even wash yourself twice just to be sure that you got it right. But the interesting thing about those who pursue the powdered donut, the interesting thing about underdogs who become wonder dogs, is that they are willing to change. They're willing to take a hard look at their muscle memory, which is what we've become used to in the shower. And they're willing to say, if what I'm doing isn't working, I'm going to find a better way to do it. And in that process, in the willingness to do the hard work of changing what has been come a habit, what you are used to day in and day out, that ability to change in the shower transforms the underdog into the wonder dog. And it starts to become the pursuit of that that led Emily down the road to the powdered donut. And so as we think about what is next, as we think about how do we make sure that not just Emily or 4,200 or 10,000, but that every single child growing up in America and around the world have the opportunity for choice-filled lives, we have to ask ourselves, is the powdered donut being added with changing the way we shower? Are we taking a long, hard look at the challenges we put in front of kids? Are we taking a long, hard look at what we define as obstacles too, lo too large to overcome? And are we willing to, are we willing to change the way we think about schooling? Are we willing to say that it is possible, it is possible that each and every child on this planet can have a choice-filled lives. I believe it is possible. We're starting to see it become possible. And when we start to do the math equation of powdered donuts 
plus showers. We will be there for choice-filled lives for everyone. Thank you.